hike morning class. Uh, so good to see you again on Monday. Uh, today uh, we're going to uh, continue our discussion of uh, neural networks and deep learning. But before I kick start the class, I also have another uh, very important message to broadcast. So as you know, at CMU, we took uh, student feedbacks on every course very seriously. And usually we do class surveys, uh, you know, uh, in a couple of time points during the lecturing so that we can collect feedbacks and uh, even uh, improve or, uh, uh, or make adjustments of the lecturing contents and, and cadence accordingly to your feedback. So that's very important for us to really get a real pulse check during the, uh, the, the presentation and during the delivery of the course. So today you will see on Piazza, you know, a uh, midterm or mid-semester uh, course survey that we're expecting all of you to fill in. So please make sure to take a few minutes uh, to uh, give us your feedback. You know, you can be as candid as possible and we're going to take uh, the feedbacks uh, very seriously and then accordingly make adjustments and make any changes if necessary, or at least uh, get a sense about, uh, you know, how uh, you feel about uh, the overall presentation delivery. Okay, so this is a message uh, that I want you to broadcast even to those people who didn't uh, show up, you know, in today's class. Uh, maybe uh, Daniel can send a message also on Piazza to all the party. Okay, now go back to our normal program. Uh, I was planning to deliver today's lecture, but while I'm prepping, uh, I hope that maybe I should invite someone even better who is himself, you know, a leader and a builder, you know, of many of the materials that I'm going to talk about today uh, in deep neural network, especially in the building blocks of uh, 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 contemporary deep neural network models. So here we have a Professor Zhi Tinghu, who was my former student and recently graduated and become, is going to become a professor of uh, machine learning and computer science at the University of California in San Diego. So he kindly agreed to uh, give a guest lecture on today's material. He is uh, an expert in many domains and, and particularly in deep neural network learning uh, using uh, you know, logical rules and the in language generation and many other applications. So with that, uh, I'm going to hand the floor to Zhi Ting, who will be uh, covering today's lecture. Hmm. Thank you, Zhi Ting. Cool. Um, thanks, Eric. Um, so, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so today we'll be talking about um, building blocks for deep learning. Okay, so, um, yeah, so let's begin by um, thinking about like uh, how we human brains, how our human brain um, represents and understands the world. So we know that um, our brain can somehow like, combine and uh, recombine simple concepts and to form more complex uh, thoughts. Like say, um, we know the concept of like CMU um, and we know the concept about like say uh, ourselves, right? And then we somehow know the, the meaning of the sentence, the, the sentence like um, I like CMU, right? So uh, this kind of like compositionality, though we don't really know like the exact mechanism um, of our brain, like how we can really like represent these um, compositional semantics um, but uh, we, we do have these uh, very um, uh, crucial abilities. So um, in analog, uh, in terms of like deep neural networks, today we'll be um, uh, seeing a kind of like a rel relevant and uh, very similar uh, compositional view of these um, neural net network components. We'll see like how these different um, very complex neural network models are indeed like consist consisting of like different um, subcomponents, like much simpler components. So uh, at the end, we'll see a kind of like hierarchy here. Um, basically, uh, different simple components are uh, composed 
or into like more complex um, models. So this is the concept of compositional machine learning. Um, as I said, right, uh, different uh, models are in different learning and actually in the whole uh, machine learning field can essentially be decomposed or break down into a uh, simpler concept of uh, building blocks. So we get a catalog of building blocks and uh, these building blocks enables a very like uh, modularized programming. We can uh, just compose like data structures, loss functions and learning uh, algorithms together to form um, quite complex uh, machine learning functionalities. And we can somehow um, building on this, we can get some like intuitive conceptual level APIs um, for our like programming and uh, creation of machine learning solutions. Yeah, so we also see um, some like real tools that really operationalize this concept um, so that we can like um, do this solution creation and uh, easy switch between algorithms like we can um, plug in or like plug out modules and without changing other uh, irrelevant parts. Okay, so yeah, this is the, the general concept of this lecture, um, the outline of this lecture. Um, so we'll be talking about different uh, specific components of building blocks um, in deep learning. Uh, this includes basically convolutional networks or recur and recurrent networks, and then uh, attention mechanisms. And uh, in the last part, we'll be um, talking about transformers, a special type of attention mechanisms that achieves a state of art, state of art performance in many tasks. So uh, yeah, during the lecture, please feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions or you may like type your questions in the chat box and uh, um, I will uh, address them uh, maybe like up to each, of, each part. So uh, to begin with, so we have seen this right, um, kind of like a neuron on in last lecture. So we can see this as the kind of like the most basic um, building block of deep learning. Right? Um, you have some like inputs x1, uh, x, right? Uh, and uh, you do a linear transformation kind of like right, by multiplying this x with the parameters w. And then you feed this into a so called activation function to have a linear kind of a, uh, to have a nonlinear um, effect. Like say, um, say um, we may use a, a relu um, activation function. So that um, with, with, some, with any input, right, uh, you'll get some uh, nonlinear effects like, some, like this. And we have other activation functions like sigmoid and uh, um, different choices basically. So with this uh, simplicity, simplicity building block, we can uh, compose these neurons into a more complex component. Um, we call it uh, neural layers. So uh, these layers have like different structures. You can see that we basically um, connect these neurons in different ways to get a different kind of layers, like say uh, fully connected layers um, or like convolutional layers with pooling. Uh, we'll be uh, seeing this later in, in this lecture. And the and recurrent networks, uh, recurrent layers, you get uh, basically a sequence of like uh, neural components so that you can um, it's, uh, read the uh, sequence data, basically. And uh, like ResNet, kind of a special case of convolutional networks. Uh, yeah, so um, besides the neural architectures, right, consisting of different layers, um, another component is so-called loss function, right? Um, 
which basically drives the model, drive the learning to um, basically find the best um, parameter values. So these loss functions can be of different types like cross entropy loss for classification, for like uh, language generation. This is kind of like one of the most common loss functions. Of course, we can have other type of loss functions like mean squared error for um, regression probably. So putting all these things together, we can somehow um, build a very complex model. Um, so this is a particular example um, showing a part of the Google Net for like um, image classification. So we can see uh, in this very complex um, architecture, different parts of the network uh, is essentially um, these different uh, building blocks. Like say here we have a uh, convolutional blocks and uh, we use like pooling or like uh, every pour, average pooling or maximum pooling to basically aggregate information from the previous layers. And we may have like fully connected layers to do further transformations. Yeah, and we may have like do like concatenation to again uh, as a different, as another way to integrate the information. Right. And uh, um, at the last layer, we do like, we apply the activation to get another layer of nonlinearity. And uh, um, we apply the loss, like cross NGP loss, to um, basically define the quality of the current model status, and then we we do the training right, by minimizing the loss. So we can see um, we can somehow actually combine the basic building blocks, and we may apply uh, different loss functions, right, um, different tasks. And given enough data, um, with these very complex architectures, we can uh, often get very uh, impressive results, like say image classification um, and other like machine translation tasks. So this are uh, basically like by training this model and with these uh, different blocks of neural uh, components, we um, get the uh, we, we learn the representation of the data, right? Um, the net, networks learns increasingly more abstract representation of the data that are um, somehow disentangled, um, especially in this uh, Google Net, uh, in, in this particular case. Um, by disentangled, we mean like um, the representations of these uh, neural layers um, are amenable to linear separation. Like you, you can somehow like uh, see a particular dimension of the feature is representing a particular concept, like um, the, the like the color or the, uh, the the shape of the uh, of the input image. So um, yeah, we'll see more examples of these uh, learned representations later. So um, yeah, with these uh, very general concepts, let's now um, dive into more like uh, specific uh, models. First is the convolutional network. So convolutional networks on this, on this model is perhaps the most widely used uh, neural models uh, in computer vision at this point. So, um, so convolutional network is basically um, inspired biologically, um, kind of like from our like a uh, visual uh, visual cortex structure. So um, there are some like basic concept here. So resective fields is uh, one of the core co uh, concepts. So here basically, uh, if you know our like the structure of, of our visual cortex, um, this cortex contains a complex arrangement of different cells. And these cells are sensitive to small subregions of the visual of the visual field. So um, convolutional network is basically inspired by this. Uh, we have given the cells, right? Uh, all, the, all the neurons, right? And the different, and at least one particular neuron is, is sensitive to a small subregion of the input, like say uh, this raw image, right? Um, this neuron is sensitive to this particular region right, of, the, um, of the image. 
and these subregions are tailed to cover the entire visual field. So basically, uh, this network exploits the strong spatially local correlation presented in natural images. Um, like uh, different neurons are sensitive to different um, subregions, like, and uh, this image you can see, like say, um, kind of like this this local features, right? Um, and also like um, uh, in, in our natural image, uh, a very uh, core uh, a core like properties that um, we have somehow so called uh, translation invariance. Like say this this um, particular person, right? Um, we we move this person a little bit to the right. Still, right. So this image is about this person, right? So this is so-called uh, translation invariance. So convolutional network is designed to build uh, to bake this uh, translation invariance into the model architecture. Yeah. So our uh, these cells we call it, we call it also call it local filters um, in convolutional networks. So. Uh, a couple, uh, a couple of like key um, properties of convolutional networks, based on the um, architecture we just seen. Um, so, uh, it it has a sparse connectivity, right? Because like even a uh, one neuron is only sensitive to a subregion of the of the input features, right? So, this this say this particular neuron is connected to. Uh, part of the neurons uh, from the last layer instead of all these layers, uh, all the neurons in the previous layer. And uh, we do this uh, shared wait waiting, say uh, uh, these connections in the same color are, are basically sharing the weight. So this basically gives you this um, translation invariance concept, right? Um, like say the person is here, then uh, this neuron can like, capture this signal, or this when the person is like translated to the right, uh, this neuron can still like capture this concept. Um, and uh, with this uh, stack, right, um, this neural uh, this neural network can increasingly increasingly uh, capture the global um, concepts in the input image. Right, because here uh, again, this neuron has the this uh, receptive fields, including these three neurons, right, in, from the previous layer. And uh, if we go a layer up, right, in the, at this layer, this neuron can receive signals from the three neurons, which uh, in turn get the signals from the whole all these neurons, right, in this layer. So um, we get increasingly get the global uh, receptive field. So simple cells are um, at the lower layer will detect local features, and the complex cells um, will pull the outputs of simple cells to uh, of, of the, within the neighborhood right, to get the uh, higher level features. So with this uh, hierarchical architecture, we uh, the model can like capture these increasingly abstract and higher level features. So this is a, a particular example. Um, given this input image, um, the lower layer of a convolutional network gets uh, this concept, kind of like the edges and uh, like corners. Right? And uh, if we investigate the features learned by the middle layers, we get somehow like a more complex concept. And uh, if we go in into further right add to the uh, higher layers, we get uh, even higher level of features, like uh, this kind of like a more complex patterns and the concepts. So, uh, okay, I see a, a list of hands. So how we should, okay. yeah, please uh, feel free. So, yeah, I was gonna ask like, uh, what's the difference between this and like the traditional neural network again? Sorry. Ah uh, yeah, so in yeah. traditional neural networks, um, so the so-called traditional neural network is the multi-layer um, perception, right? MLP. So it's basically a fully connected layer, right? So every layer um, is like fully connected with the the previous layer, right? So 
um, that's the kind of like the most basic uh, new network. So, so this one, like they choose like certain features to connect to, then they don't connect to the entire layer. Yeah, okay. so convolutional network is designed to have this uh, kind of a more special architecture. It's not like a fully connected layers. So right. we have these like sparse connectivities, shared weights, and um, sorry. So with this, we encode this our uh, inductive bias of like translation invariance into the new model. So in other words, this model guarantee that um, this model can uh, recognize the translation in 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 an input image. Right. So uh, this is the key uh, difference from previous like NLP. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So uh, with the new network, with this convolution network, we can uh, learn the hierarchical representations. So uh, this so this is the kind of like most of the basic convolutional network architecture. And uh, since um, 2012, um, so AlexNet was the first um, kind of like a large scale new network that really large scale convolutional network that really achieved um, very impressive um, kind of uh, lens state of art performance in the real task um, image classification on image nets. So, Alex nets consist of eight, eight convolutional layers. So, and later we uh, kind of like got a more kind of like a much deeper and a larger convolutional network called VGG, consisting of uh, 19 layers. And the Google Net, as uh, we just saw, uh, is even like deeper. And now, the latest and the state of art uh, image classifier is built um, as a so called residual network, ResNet. It's uh, much, much deeper than um, the previous versions. So, like, say, it can consist of like up to like 100 layers or like even 1000 layers. So, these are kind of a more advanced version of convolution networks. Basically, you can see them as a different uh, composition of the convolutional layers, which as uh, which as a saw. So this is a very simple and quick uh, introduction of con convolutional uh, networks. Um, the key concept is about the um, the receptive fields and uh, this uh, special uh, connections between neurons to enable to encode the uh, inductive bias of translation invariance. So next, um, just visit recur recurrent network. So from convolutional networks to recurrent networks, the motivation is that um, so convolutional networks, as we just see, uh, we just saw, is more about the spa spatial modeling, right? Um, one neuron is uh, responsible for a, a particular subregion of the input image, right? And uh, uh, this is uh, um, kind of like a, a, uh, of a concept of like uh, spatial modeling. Right? And uh, uh, we can somehow like uh, see this as a uh, simplify this, uh, this, this diagram into this uh, kind of a single step um, model. Like uh, you have input like uh, image and the output is the feature of this image. This is a one step modeling. And uh, um, so what if our, our input is a sequence, right? Like say a, a video, right? We have a sequence of frames or sequence of images. Or like in like a language modeling, our input is a sequence of tokens, right? So uh, in these cases, we need a sequential modeling to model the sequence of data. So the idea is that we can repeatedly use this uh, this particular architecture to read the data like step by step, uh, the, the sequential data. So this basically uh, uh, leads lead us to the so-called recurrent network. If we like uh, basically unpack this uh, kind of a loop uh, for the, for the sequence data, we get 
somehow get this architecture right. Uh, say in language modeling, we feed the tokens one by one, right? Um, let's, let's say the first token, right? We get, we use like a convolutional network or whatever, like NLP to capture the features. And then we, based on the features of the first step, we can uh, further feed in the second token in the sentence and uh, get the uh, feature of the second token. And uh, this process again uh, goes on and we get uh, features of the whole sequence. So we can see our recurrent network is for sequential modeling. Um, and compared to convolutional network or MLP, single step MLP, um, we can see like uh, in convolution network, we have a fixed number of computation, computation steps. Right? Uh, given the inputs, we, uh, this input will go through all these layers um, pre-specified and uh, get the output. So in, in recurrent networks, this computation is not fixed. Right? This really depends on your, say, the, the, the length of the sentence, right? the number of tokens in the sentence. So you have, say you have you have ten like tokens in the sentence, then you will apply this um, particular uh, module like, for time for ten times to capture all the features of uh, of all the tokens. Uh, again, uh, like in convolutional networks, we have given the variance right to like say ResNet or like AlexNet. In recurrent networks, we also have uh, different uh, different forms or architectures for different tasks. Um, we can see like image classification um, as a special case or degenerate uh, case of recurrent net networks is a kind of a single step recurrent network. Input is a uh, image, like saying like output is the, uh, the feature or the, the class of the image. Right? So this is a one-to-one -one mapping. Um, we can do like one to many mapping, right? Um, say in image captioning, right? Given an image, we want to generate a like sequence of tokens, um, which is uh, which is a, like a caption of the of the image, right? So um, given input is image, output is uh, the the tokens in the caption. So it's one to many mapping. And uh, similarly, we can do like many to one mapping, like say in sentence sentiment classification or like a, um, video recognition, but the, Im the input is a sequence, like a sequence of tokens or sequence of frames. Output is a, is a single label, like say the sentiment positive, negative of the sentence or like a, the, the, the action label or, uh, within this video. Um, but even further, we can do like many-to-many -many mapping, like in machine translation, right? So inputs can be a, a, a sentence in like a, in German and the output might be a sentence in English, right? So uh, we call this kind of task as a sequence to sequence, like we map from one sequence to another sequence. Um, and manage, from many-to-many -many mapping, there is a, another case uh, say in uh, named entity recognition, input is a, is a sentence. And for each of the tokens in the sentence, we want to predict a label for this sentence. Say whether this token belongs to a particular entity, right? So um, you can see the different architecture between this, this type of many-to-many -many mapping on this type of many-to-many -many mapping. Right? Um, this here, um, the output is of the same dense of the uh, with the with the input. Uh, we have this uh, one one mapping of this output and the input tokens. And here, um, this mapping is like in a more flexible way. Uh, the output six sentence may be of different lengths of the input sentence. Right? So for this for this kind of many to many mapping, we usually call this as a sequence tagging task. Um, we kind of like tag or label each of the tokens in the input sentence. Okay, so I see a raised hand. Hmm. Yeah, so I had a question about like the one-to-many, like RNN. So I was wondering how this is different from like a normal ne neural network if we don't have like a sequence of inputs. Sequence of inputs on, 
Yeah, so for like a let's so for like a standard convolutional network, right? Um, the input is like an image, like a single like a single step input, and you get a single output like a label. And uh, for this kind of like one to many mapping, like say image captioning, kind of like um, very similar in this case, you don't really know um, the the lens of the output, like you may generate a sentence of like 10 tokens or maybe 100 tokens. So um, in this uh, output part, uh, you will generate a sequence of tokens, basically uh, using like recurrent networks. Like you can really use like convolution networks to generate a, a like a variable length um, sequence. Right? So, um, does this answer your question? Yeah, that helps. Yeah, so uh, this is the, uh, these are the basic um, commonly used um, kind of like forms of recurrent networks. So uh, in this, uh, in, in a standard recurrent network, uh, there's a kind of like a, a, a bottleneck or like a, a key challenge um, for training the neural network, uh, the recurrent networks. Called, we, we call it, this challenge is called the vanishing or ex exploding gradients. So uh, here's the a more detailed um, view of the computation inside the recurrent network. Like we have a sequence of like say tokens and the computation is like this. Uh, we have the input feature, the, the initial feature H and we input the first the token right, and do some computation like uh, in this way and get the feature of the of this, the first step. And then this step will be fed into the next step to incorporate the second token, right? And again, go through this uh, computation, right? With, with, with the parameters W and do this activation and get the um, feature of the second step. And this process uh, will repeat until we read in all the tokens in, in a sentence. So the problem is that, um, say, at the last step, right, and then we compute a loss, uh, loss right, um, say, cross entropy loss. And then based on these loss, we want to minimize the loss using gradient back propagation, right, um, denoted uh, in, as uh, red arrows. So the problem here is that um, with this uh, the chain of computation, right, um, so after applying the grid back propagation um, to compute the gradient of the, like say the initial uh, feature, this gradient of H0 uh, involves many factors of W because in this computation, computation train, uh, we basically multiply W right, again and again. Right? So uh, in the backward pass, uh, this gradient will also involve many factors of W. And the problem is that uh, when the largest the singular value of the of the of the parameters w is larger than one, we will uh, basically uh, have this issue of like exploding gradient because we apply this w again, multiply the w again and again, and the multitude of the uh, gradient will be like amplified right uh, repeatedly and. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, the gradient will like explode. Yes. And if the, uh, the, sing the largest singular value is smaller than one, we experience uh, vanishing gradients um, by uh, multiplying W again and again, the gradient uh, will be kind of like 10 to zero, basically, making the, uh, the training very ineffective. So for exploding gradient, we can somehow have, have some like tricks, like right? say we, we do this value clipping as right? when the gradient is like larger than a threshold, we just uh, uh, root force the uh, clip this gradient. But for vanishing gradient is, uh, is, is, uh, is much harder to like have uh, some similar tricks to uh, uh, sidestep this issue. So um, for more details, uh, you may uh, refer to these papers um, for like uh, say uh, theoretical uh, analysis of this phenomenon. Yeah, so yeah, any question on this? 
I had a question. Yeah. Um, wait, so the, what's the singular value of, like, what are you taking the singular values of? Uh, yeah, for any matrix, right, you can compute the singular value with SVD decomposition. This is kind of like um, the uh, concepts in like uh, linear algebra. Um, yeah, but like, are, are you taking the singular value of the W matrices or the... Like, yeah, singular value of W matrix. Right? Okay. This print, yeah. Thanks. Okay, so, um, so with this, this uh, computation issue, uh, this leads to another challenge, basically. Um, we call this long-term dependency program, uh, problem, like say to model a sequence, right? Uh, say I live in France and I know, uh, say the task is to predict the next token. Um, say the, the answer is French, right? So uh, how, how do we know? Because we know this particular token in the, in the, uh, in the sentence, right? And um, kind of like a, a, a couple of like tokens before this, um, the, the, the blank. So this, this task might, this, in this case, this prediction might be easy, but what if we, uh, this sentence is much longer, right? Um, like for, uh, France, a beautiful country, and I know, right? And this, and to predict this, this blank, this uh, clue words kind of like uh, pretty far away from this blank, right? So how can, so modeling this much longer context or like a dependency, uh, it's becoming uh, much harder because of this uh, vanishing gradient on the explosion gradient problem. Right? Um, we can't really uh, train this model to effectively capture this long-term dependency. Yeah, so um, here comes a solution as a more like a systematic and uh, principled uh, uh, solution to this uh, vanishing or like exploding gradient and the long-term dependency problem. Uh, this model is called LST, LSTM as a, as, a, as a variant of recurrent network. So this is a standard recurrent network, right? We have simple computation inside each of the steps. And the LSTM is a, a, a different, a more complex um, architecture compared to the standard RNN. Uh, in each cell, we have uh, this multiple steps of computation. So here's uh, uh, more details of this computation. Um, you, you don't really have to uh, remember or like uh, uh, basically yeah, remember all these details of this computation. I'm just going to give you a, a general uh, intuition um, of this, uh, the, the design of the particular, um, particular model. So this LSTM uh, designed a couple of like gate functions to make decisions of reading, writing, re and resetting information. So it includes a couple of gates, uh, gate function, like for forget gates, input gates, and output gates. So these forget gates will determine uh, whether we, I want to like erase the information from the previous cells. And the input gates capture, uh, determines like how much information we should read from, uh, okay, input gates, is here, right? Uh, how, mu how much information we should uh, kind of like uh, write into this, uh, into this particular cell um, based on the input and the output gates determines how much uh, information we should review uh, uh, to the next step. So uh, forget gates um, decides how much, we, how much we want to remove um, from uh, last step uh, with this computation. So uh, sigma here is an activation function, captures the, the magnitudes of like um, the information we want, uh, we want to remove, yeah. Uh, Siting, we had a question in the chat. Someone was saying, what is CT in this case? I CT. think it was on the previous slide. Where's CT? Um, Azan, do you want to uh, unmute and? Uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, it was the diagram the, with the, the LSTM. The cells. LSTM, okay. Yeah. Yeah, this one. Right here. Okay. 
CT. Okay, so this is a uh, you can see uh, so in LS, in LSTM we have this representation of the features like uh, um, at each step. So CT and HT are all the features. Basically. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so input gates um, decide what new information to to store in the cell. Um, with with this uh, computation, uh, you don't, again you don't really have to like uh, really like know like why this is designed like this. Uh, it's because it's more uh, on these heuristics. Right? Um, but the, the key the key intuition is that uh, we have this different uh, like a feature transformation right with this uh, matrix and uh, these buyers. And uh, you, you then apply an activation function to capture like uh, uh, the proportion of information we want to incorporate uh, into the into the cell. Right. And uh, uh, then uh, we update the cell state by combining the uh, the state from the last step, um, basically captured and uh, like scaled by the like, forget gate, and uh, the information from the inputs of this. Uh, uh, at this at, at the current step, uh, scaled by the input gate, and the output gates are uh, determines like how much information we want to review um, or output to the next step or to the uh, to the output. Again, uh, with the same mechanism, right? This this gate function or the activation function. So uh, with this architecture, we can see that uh, this. LSTM basically built this pathway uh, to like back propagate the gradient. Uh, like say from the last step to the first step, we have a so-called uninterrupted gradient flow. So uh, within this path, you don't really uh, involve multiplications with the matrix W uh, during back propagation. So this essentially uh, allevi alleviates the, uh, the problem of finishing gradient or exploding gradient. Okay, so um, we have seen this uh, the current networks and the LSTN as a particular uh, case of recurrent networks. So LSTN is widely used uh, in like language modeling for like modeling uh, wrong sequences. So next, let's see more like uh, applications of recurrent networks. Basically, uh, each of each application falls into falls into one of the categories here. So uh, we have, uh, we can also do like a bi-directional like sequence modeling, right? We can model a sentence from left to right. And we can also do this uh, from right to left, right? To capture the dependencies between different tokens in the sentence. So here we can basically combine the two directions to get a bi-directional recurrent network. We can also like capture even a more flexible structure of the data. Like say, if the input is is a tree, like say a, a passing tree of a sentence, we can also like organize the recurrent network in this way, right? In, in a tree structure, and the, the say the inputs of the of a particular cell in the LSTN are uh, includes the the features of all the child nodes, right? Uh, in a tree. Uh, similarly, we can like uh, model like 2D sequences, like say for an, for an image, right? This is basically a 2D matrix. Um, each, each node is a, is a pixel, right? Like in in in, loss, in the raw image, and we can like say, in, uh, yeah, we, one uh, particular we can use a convolution network to capture this uh, image, right? Like, we can also use uh, recurrent networks to capture these to these uh, data uh, by defining a particular order of like uh, encoding these different uh, of the, uh, encoding the, the, the pixels. So say for this neuron um, or this LSTM cell, we the inputs uh, includes the um, the information from the of the cells um, uh, in in at least row and also um, in the, the previous layer, basically. Or uh, we can like uh, organize uh, in a different uh, uh, structure to capture this, uh, this uh, particular uh, dependency orders. 
So this, uh, how do we decide this uh, different uh, kind of like structure? This is more uh, based on your own intuition or the heuristics, like how I want to uh, capture these dependencies between different pixels in the image. And similarly, we can like uh, enable the kind of like mo most general structure, the graph structure, right? Uh, by like say first segments the image into different uh, segmentations, and for each each of the segmentation, we can use uh, apply a LSTM cell to capture the information in this uh, segmentation, and we connect these different nodes cells together to model the whole image. Okay, so um. We have seen the convolution networks, recurrent networks. Uh, in the third part, we will uh, be visiting the attention mechanism, which is the kind of like one of the most important components in modern deep neural networks to really uh, kind of capture even like longer, like longer term dependencies and to imp make sure uh, uh, to basically improve the performance of this modeling and like classification and prediction. So uh, first let me give an example of this attention. Um, so here the, the task is image captioning, given image, we want to generate a, a sentence to describe the image. Um, so when we say for this image, right, uh, when we generate the token for this B, um, we, as a human, right, so we, we we have attention, right? Um, like say, we attend to this particular part of the image, uh, and based on this, we come up with this token, like this B, right? And to say, um, yeah, basically like a stop sign, right? This, this token stop is basically describing this particular region of the input image. So this is called uh, attention. And then similarly, in, in like a machine translation, right? So given an English image, uh, sentence, we generate another sentence in a different language. And uh, when we translate and generate a particular token in the target language, like say this token, this token really depends on, really is because of this particular token in the input sentence, right, European. So uh, naturally this uh, generation will attend to, uh, or should attend to this particular token, right, to get the most critical information from the input. So uh, yeah, this is the basic concept of attention. Then uh, computationally, why do we need this attention, right? Um, first, this enables to uh, better model this long range dependency or long term dependency. Like say in this machine translation, right? Um, this particular output token depends on this particular uh, input, like, uh, like right? So you can see uh, with a uh, standard recurrent network or even LSTM net network, uh, the, the, the distance between this token to the input token is really, uh, really long, right? Uh, really large. So uh, the modeling of this dependency is very difficult. But with attention, right, we, uh, we have this attention module, then you can see there is a very much shorter pathway from this output token to the input token, right? through these attention uh, blocks. And the second uh, advantage of using attention is that um, we, have, we get a finer grained representation instead of a single global representation. So this particular token um, will, yeah, this particular output token will have, have a, a so-called uh, attention uh, ways across all the input tokens. And uh, with these ways, you mix the uh, input features according to this, this weight. I will see uh, more, detailed, uh, more details in the next slide. And uh, uh, different output token correspond to different uh, attention weights. And this weight basically mix the input tokens uh, in a uh, yeah, specifically right, to, this, to a particular output token so that you get a fine-grained implementation. And then also we get improved interpretability by visualizing the, the attention ways we know like, okay, why this model um, predict this particular token? This is because uh, this model finds that, okay, this, this uh, input token is relevant and uh, the, the output is depending on this input. So uh, more details of the uh, attention computation. Um, again, let's use the uh, machine translation as an example. 
So we have an encoder, right, or say uh, LSTN currency networks to encode uh, each of the tokens uh, in the input sentence and get this sequence of features. And then um, when we do the decoding to generate the tokens in the, in the output sentence, uh, at each step, we uh, perform a linear combination of the input vectors weighted by the attention weights. So um, we denote attention weights as A. Um, so here, um, say the weights is like, like this, right? Uh, for each of the uh, input features. And we do this, um, yeah, this is the weight. And we do this uh, weighted average of the input uh, features. And then we condition the generation of the output token on the uh, resulting uh, mixed features. So first is how do we compute these um, attention weights, right? So this involves a couple of like key concepts in attention computation, uh, including the query and the key and the values. So uh, at this particular decoding step, um, this, uh, the, the, the feature of this decoding step is called the query. And we use this as a query and uh, use the input um, features of the, of, of the input sentence as the, as the keys, then we compute the, basically the similarity between um, this uh, query and the each of the keys, and we get the, the similarity score, right, um, corresponding to each of the uh, input steps. And then we do a normalization to uh, get the, uh, the, the attention weights, right, by applying the softmax function on top of the, uh, the, 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 the similarity scores. Yeah, so this is the attention weights. And then we, after getting these weights, we, get, uh, we take a weighted sum of the, uh, of the values, which are, the, again, the, the encoded states, right, so that we get a mixed, um, we get a mixed uh, the features of the input. And these mixed features can be used to uh, generate the next token. So this attention score, um, or like this alignment score or similarity score between the query and the keys can be computed in different ways. Um, say we have like content-based attention using this cosine uh, similarity function to compute the, uh, the, the similarity between query and the keys. And we have other, many other different ways to compute this similarity. Okay, so uh, let, let's see a couple of like more concrete examples on in like uh, in different applications. So um, here in this image captioning, we just uh, saw for this attention, right? From, um, from the language to image, the input image. The query again is the state, the, the decoder state, right? Say to generate this token, we have this query, right? And then we compute the similarity between the query and the keys. And here, key is the visual uh, feature maps um, extracted by the convolutional network, right? Remember that uh, in convolutional network, we um, can extract the features of the subregions, right? As the receptive field, right, of the input image. So we have a collection of like uh, uh, feature maps. And then um, we compute the similarity between the query and the keys and the get the attention score and then do the mixing uh, of the, again, the values are like uh, the visual feature maps. And, uh, yeah, and with the mixed feature, we generate the tokens like one by one. Basically. And uh, uh, yeah, we'll skip this. Details. So here are some results, like say generating this sentence, a bird flying over a body of water. Um, when we generate the birds, we will model correctly attended to this particular region of the image. And um, we can use like soft attention, like by applying a soft max uh, normalization on top of like um, the alignment score or similarity score to get a soft attention, like a kind of a distribution of all the regions of the image. Or we may apply a hard attention, like to just get the, the, the highest value of the uh, of the a similarity score, right? And uh, um, use that particular 
uh, respective uh, input feature as the as the feature to generate this token. So um, for with hard attention, we get this kind of like attention pattern. So um, this might be less uh, effective. So soft attention is uh, more widely used uh, in uh, in practice. So attention uh, on images, uh, say here. Uh, for image paragraph generation, right? Um, instead of generating a single token, uh, a single uh, a single sentence, we sometimes want to generate a long paragraph to describe an image. So this is a kind of another um, more complex model to really handle this uh, more difficult task. So here, um, we first for image, we first like uh, extract all the bounding boxes in in the image to like capture like uh, different entities and the different activities in the image. And for each, and then for each of the uh, bounding box, we will generate a local phrase using the image captioning model we just, uh, we just saw to generate a single like phrase or like a sentence to describe um, the region. And then um, we use an, Attention, uh, attention reasoning or like a kind of hierarchical generator to like a, um, to both like a, attend to the, to the regions of the image and the, the local phrases we generated to like a, get a output paragraph. So um, here's an example. Um, with this image, we've, we find this bounding boxes and then we for each bounding box we generate a local phrase like people riding a bike which is corresponds to the like the, the, the whole region here right and then with uh, co-attention to the image and the phrases we generate the paragraph like a group of people are riding bikes like right, which co essentially correspond to this bounding box and uh, this phrase right? so this is the image paragraph uh, paragraph generation as a particular example of attention. Okay, so um, yeah, having seen the uh, attention mechanisms, right? Uh, remember the key concept here: query, key, and uh, value. And uh, uh, we compute the attention ways based on query and the keys, and then uh, mix the values um, with these uh, attention weights, right? And uh, use the mixed weights to. Uh, as the condition to generate the prediction or the, uh, the, uh, the generation in a language uh, generation task. So next, uh, transformers uh, is a transformer is a, is a is a kind of like a very uh, uh, emerging model architecture that achieves state of art performance in many tasks, and we'll see that the key uh, components within uh, transformers. Is is a particular attention mechanism called multi-head attention. So um, let's let's take a look at this particular architecture. So um, yeah, transformers achieve state of other results in like machine translation, um, pre-trained the text representation. We probably we all know that words right as a as as a text representation model, and the, like language generation. So uh, inside these transformers, uh, uh, the key architecture is the multi-head attention. The input is, uh, again, the key concept, right? The key concept, query, keys, and value. Um, so this is a particular uh, attention called the scaled dot product attention. The, the key thing is that the computation of the similarity score between the query and the keys uh, is carried out with this particular architecture. Um, you do this multiplication, do a scaling, and uh, some masking, and uh, with a soft max attention to hey, like uh, normalize the weight. Zeting, there's a question yeah. in the chat. Someone says, uh, for soft attention, we use the soft max function, but for hard attention, what was the activation function again? Yeah, so for our hard attention, you can use different, again, you have different choices. You can use like argmax to like pick out the, the largest uh, similarity, right? Or you can use a stochastic kind of sampling, right? Based on the, on the, on the, on the weights, based proportional to the weights. Okay, so um, yeah, you have soft max to get the soft attention here, right? Um, and then uh, do the mixing. 
So uh, this building, this block, attention block can be re is repeated uh, for multiple times, like H times, and you get the so-called multi-head attention. Um, yeah, basically you have a, a, a N copies of the attention so that you get, uh, um, but with different uh, parameters, so that uh, the model can capture different attention patterns uh, in this, uh, of different cases. And this uh, multi-head attention block is further encapsulated as a building block, um, multi-head attention. And uh, in the transformers, we will stack our, we'll compose other components like add and the normalization and the feed forward module, and then add and normalization. And uh, this is uh, a kind of like a, a module in transformers. And with this module, uh, we see this as a block and this block can be further stacked it and combined with different the blocks together to form the whole like a transformer model, like including encoder and the decoder. Right. So let's see, um, yeah, for this, the whole like transformer model, right? Um, so we have seen this part, right? Which is like encoders, we call it encoder self attention. This because, um, here query and the keys and the values are all set to the input values, uh, the input features. Uh, this is why we call it self-attention. And then um, similarly for decoder, right, to generate the, the, the output sentence token by token, we again have this decoder self-attention to uh, basically attend to itself. And then between the encoder and the decoder, we have our encoder decoder attention. Um, again, it's a multi-head attention and the, the key and the values are set to like uh, the key, the encoder features and the query is set to the decoder uh, features, right? As in the uh, machine translation model we have seen or like in image captioning models. So with this architecture, um, or this transformer as it was first proposed in 2017, it achieved the state of art results in machine translation and later, um, people like uh, customize this uh, the architecture a little bit, uh, especially using the transformer encoder to uh, get a pre-trained model called a BERT, pre-trained text fragmentation model. And this, this, this is the kind of now the widely, most widely used uh, text representation model to get the uh, features of, of like the text data. So uh, a little bit of context of this of text representation. Right? Um, traditionally, we use so-called word embedding to capture the basically to map uh, discrete tokens to like continuous feature factors, like um, say in word to word to vector or like graph. Um, basically, uh, this word embedding is a is a is a joint matrix that right? each token corresponds to a, a feature vector, right, in the matrix. So uh, given a, a paragraph, right, we map each of the tokens um, into the visual vectors by, look up, by looking up in the, in, the, in the matrix or dictionary. Right. So this is the traditional um, word embedding. First is a different uh, a new way of like extracting text features by contextualizing the word embeddings. So the intuition is that um, for each token, right, uh, this representation should be all, not only depending on its uh, itself, but also its context, right? So, uh, so this model basically like capture the whole sequence, uh, model the whole sequence, and and extract the features of each of the tokens, right? With very complex um, uh, computation inside the inside the model, and uh, we and the uh, Actually, in each of the blocks in the model, um, again, the, the block is the multi-head attention block we have seen in transformers. So uh, this model is very complex, but you basically stack uh, this self-attention and multi-head attention blocks together to uh, basically form this uh, joint bird model. And like say for like say for image cl uh, sentence classification, right? It will input this uh, a sequence of tokens, and you get a sequence of like a, a, 
a sequence of like features like corresponding to each of the tokens. And for classification, you we have a, usually we have a special token atten, uh, appended it to the to the beginning of the sentence, and this the feature of this particular token is used for like classification. Um, like say for like a, a binary classification here. Yeah, so uh, this birds achieve really uh, impressive results, um, achieving state of art on 12 NLP tasks, like say uh, sentiment, sentiment classification, question answering, and like uh, entailment prediction, and a lot of like given the tasks. So uh, a little bit about how we really train this model, right? Um, and for the model architecture is a big transformer encoder, basically um, consisting of like uh, hundreds of millions of reparameters to be trained. And then uh, the model is trained using a large data set recording Wikipedia and the collection of free ebooks consisting of billions of tokens. And then for the loss function, we use um, the, the loss function is called masked, masked language model. Um, the, the procedure is basically like this. We mask out uh, some percent of the words from the input, and uh, the task is to reconstruct those words from the context. So here is the uh, diagram on this um, training. So given a, the training sentence, right, um, like this, we randomly mask out some of the tokens, like 15% uh, percent of the tokens, and replace this token uh, with, uh, with the mask token, a special token. And then um, we want the model to be able to pre reconstruct this particular token, the master of token. So we uh, um, basically, this is a class classification task, right, on top of this master token. Um, yeah, with these features, we apply a classifier here and uh, maximize the likelihoods of the ground truth token, right, or in the input. So, uh, this is the, the, the first task used to train the um, BERT model. And the second task is so-called two-sentence task. So in the first task, the issue is that the, ta the first task may uh, enforce the model to understand the, 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 the context within the particular sentence, right, and to predict the master of the token. But uh, the, the drawback is that uh, the model does not really know the, the dependency between different sentences or like longer term context. So these two sentence task is ser served as an augmentation to the first task to let, basically let the model understand relationships between sentences. So uh, the task is to like concatenate two sentences and uh, let the model predict whether this, the second sentence is a natural continuation of the first sentence. Right. So uh, again, this is a binary classification task. Okay, so um, for training, um, this is a joint model with uh, trained on a large data. So the computation is really intensive. Um, say within, with a standard for GPU desktop, you may have to like uh, spend like 100 days uh, on like training of the model. But fortunately, this model is pre-trained and the, the, the pre-trained ways are released. So now, we can just like load the pre-trained weights and uh, stack on whatever other components you want on top of this pre-trained model to get uh, whatever model like like sentiment, sentence classification or like a machine translation right by stacking a decoder on top of this uh, bird encoder. Yeah, so um, for this uh, practical use of BERT and the other like pre-trained models like uh, GPT-2 as a language model or like transformer as a machine translation model, uh, there are, there are, uh, there are different tools to enable this. And the Texer is a, is a kind of like a general purpose tool to uh, enable like uh, this kind of like different uh, applications. Uh, of course, including the word embedding uh, stuff. So as I mentioned, right, for traditional word embedding, like a word, word to vector or graph, um, we have like a matrix, right? basically a joint matrix. Uh, so we can, with Texer, we can like um, build this word embedder um, by initializing uh, the matrix with uh, the pre-trained weights. Right? 
and then use the embedder to encode, uh, in, to embed text into uh, text embedding features. Yeah. So, um, so with Texer, you can like build these uh, like embedders and uh, like stack a classifier on top of the embedder to do this classification. And uh, um, you may specify the configurations, like say, now I want to use a word to vector as the, uh, as the word embedding matrix, then we load the word, word to vector, or we can load the glove to use the glove word embedding. And now say we want to like upgrade this program, right, to use a more advanced embedding, a bird embedding. Then again, this is again a, a, a bird mod, a word embedding model, right? So components in, in the whole like a uh, workflow. So here we like build the transformer encoder, which is the, the underlying architecture of bird. And then we initialize this, this embedder uh, using the bird's checkpoint, right? And then uh, we can like again embed the text using the embed to get the bird embeddings and do the classification. So you only need to change this embed part without touching other irrelevant parts like classifier layers. So um, similarly with with Texer, we can like build more complex models, like say with attentional um, sequence to sequence model for machine translation. Um, yeah, we have this. Um, we read the data. Uh, encodes the encodes the source sentence using word embedders and then uh, using encoder to get the in, uh, encoding features, and then we use a decoder right to like with attentions to attend to the encoder features, and then um, do the decoding to get the uh, output tokens uh, one by one, basically. and then we evaluate the loss function like cross HP. To, uh, to build the laws and uh, do the optimization based on the laws. Yeah, so again, uh, for like, uh, just like in embedder, right? Uh, for other tasks, like for other modules, like decoder, encoder, we can specify the hyperparameters or configurations. Like what, like say, if this is a recurrent network decoder, we can specify what type of cell we want to use. We can use FSTM cell. We can also use other type of different iron cells like uh, GRU and uh, many different uh, more advanced ones. We can specify the number of layers on uh, for the iron and uh, what type of attention, right? Based on like how we want to compute the uh, the similarity metrics between uh, similarity scores between the query and the keys, right? So okay, so uh, this is pretty much I, about this lecture. Um, the key takeaways. Um, so we we see, we have seen the convolutional networks right as a, a variant of the uh, MLP to uh, bake the concept of like translation invariance into the model architecture. Uh, you have like sparse connectivity and the shared weights to like really enable this uh, property. And the recurrent network uh, is for like sequence modeling. We have LSTM designed to uh, capture long range dependency and uh, combating the vanishing gradients. And the uh, RN is not really only for sequence data. We can also organize the model correctly, uh, properly to model like 2D sequences, trees, and graphs. And the uh, attention is a, a crucial addition to this basic uh, architecture and the RN to really get better performance and uh, more interpretability. Right? Um, C3 core concepts in attention, query, key, and value. And the many variants based on the alignment score function or like a similarity score function between the query and the keys. And the attention, we have seen application like image captioning is to attend from text to image. Image translation is text to text. Right? And the transformers are basically consist of a Many blocks of multi head attention blocks. Um, like, uh, say, the, the first transformer model is an encoder decoder structure architecture for like machine translation and birds basically use the transformer encoder, um, a, a very large transformer encoder, to and pre train on a large corpus of text to get a pre trained text representation model. GPT 2, we haven't really uh, talked about this, but it's basically a Transformer decoder 
um, with not head attention, right? And uh, again, it's pre-trained on a very large corpus to get a pre-trained language model. Okay, so the last slide is, uh, includes some resources about Texer. Um, if you are doing like course projects or research, you may use Texer to like uh, uh, help um, build your like uh, complex models. So we have like GitHub repos. This, this is an open source project. Um, exam we have example and documentations and we welcome any contributions and collaborations uh, within this open source project. Okay, this is pretty much I want to uh, talk today. So I'm happy to take uh, more questions if we have any. Um, someone asked um, how big is, uh, is the pre-trained weights of, the, of BERT? Like how big is the file, sorry? How big is the model? Uh, how big is the pre-trained weights file of BERT? Oh, how big? Uh, I don't really uh, remember this. It's kind of like a couple of like gigabytes, I guess, for for the large the large one. For a smaller version, you may have like a uh, like couple hundreds of uh, megabytes. Okay. Okay, looks like no more questions. Thank you, Jitin, for the presentation. Uh, today we hear uh, a number of uh, new concepts such as embedding, such as uh, single values and, uh, and so on, uh, in their very advanced context in deep neural network. In fact, uh, in the next couple of lectures, we're going to unwind and uh, talk about some of the basic operations and the original uh, incarnation of uh, such concepts you know, in uh, traditional machine learning models and uh, methodologies. So stay tuned. I guess with that, uh, we can close today's lecture. Uh, see you next week. Uh, no, see you on Wednesday.